Imagine unlocking your brain's hidden powers so you could earn more, achieve more, and live more. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest from The Secret is John Asheraf. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and KCAA Radio here in Southern California. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, it's my favorite portion of the show when we bring on a, a thought leader, a really cool person, and somebody's going to help me and also all of you listeners out there with some new information that can help you you know, improve your day-to-day -day life because I know how busy everybody is out there and sometimes we don't have time, but my job is to bring you the best information possible and I've got one of the best of the best today. My uh, special guest, his name is John Asaraf. He He's one of the stars of The Secrets. He's a top high-performance success coach, one of the best in the world, a leading mindset and behavioral expert who has helped people discover how to strengthen and upgrade their mental and emotional skills so they can achieve their biggest dreams and goals. John uh, grew the Remax of Indiana from a startup to 85 offices and $4 billion a year in revenue. He was also one of the founders of bamboo.com that went public. He's written four books, two New York Times bestsellers that have been translated into 35 languages. He's been featured in 10 movies, including, of course, The Secret and Quest for Success with Richard Branson and the Dalai Lama. And today, John is the CEO of My Neuro Gym com, a neuroscience-based company dedicated to helping individuals strengthen their mindset and skills so they achieve their goals and dreams faster and easier than ever. He's a self-made man. I dare say he's a guy's guy, and John is the third expert from The Secret to appear on Guys Guys Radio. I'm so thrilled and honored that he's here. Welcome to the show, John Asaraf. Mr. Robert, great to be <laughs> on with you. <clears throat> Okay, let's start at the beginning. I'll give some uh, folks who may not be familiar with it a little bit of background. You had some challenges growing up in Montreal, I believe, when it came to your family dynamics. At the age of 19, you met somebody, his name was Alan Brown, who became your mentor, and he helped set you on a path that led to your financial success and also success in, in, as an individual. So tell us, what happened? How did he show up? How did you know he had something to uh, uh uh, give you uh, uh, from his perspectives and teachings that would really help you in the future. And I know he got into something about interest versus commitment and uh, focusing your energy and uh, a lot of things like that, that kind of set you on the path. What happened, John? Sure. So um, from the time my family moved from Israel to Montreal, I fell behind in school um, because I spoke at the time Hebrew, and then um, I had to learn English and French and classes were filled with 50, 60 classes. Teachers didn't have the time to, you know, single out um, several students that had challenges. So it's either you keep up with the class or you fall behind. That's simple. By the time, you know, grade three, four and five came, I was two years behind. And by the time grade seven came, uh, I knew that school wasn't for me. Um, and the reason is I failed English and math and was made fun of and ridiculed of who, who fails English and math in grade seven. And the answer was, I did. So I developed um, a, a challenge with my thinking uh, that I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't getting the grades that the other kids were getting. I uh, didn't understand some of the math that I was starting to get into. And it just was difficult. And um, so instead of doing that, I spent a lot of time leaving the school with a group of other kids, um, shoplifting, shoplifting, breaking and entering, uh, doing drugs, selling drugs, drinking alcohol, and doing a lot of illegal things to keep myself busy to put some money in my pocket. Uh, by the time I was um, 17, 18, you know, after being uh, in and out of police stations enough times to uh, cause my parents to be extremely concerned, uh, my brother met this man who was a successful real estate developer and the owner of some real estate offices in Toronto, Canada. I was living in Montreal at the time and my brother just said, hey bro, um, you're going to either die or go to jail. Um, there's a man that I met that might be able to help you. And I said, you know, I don't need any help. Uh, he said, well, why don't you come to, San to, to Toronto and have lunch with us and you and I can hang for the weekend. So I said, sure. <clears throat> I took the train to um, Toronto. And uh, at lunch, this guy was very cordial, very nice, um, dressed well, was in shape, uh, seemed very, very humble, which he was. And he asked me a whole bunch of questions though, like, why, why are you getting into so much trouble? Why are you doing those things? 
And I remember my answer was, I don't know. I just want to like make some money and, you know, um, have, have a group of friends. And before I knew it, he was asking me what my goals were. And um, I said, oh, I'd like to move out of my parents' house. I was 19 at the time now. I want to get a car because the only car I had was my father's taxi, which he didn't want me driving. Um, and, um, and then uh, I wanted to get a job that paid me more than the $1.65 that I was making working in the shipping department of Philips Electronics in, Toronto, in Montreal. And um, <clears throat> I was making more money selling drugs on the side than I was working, you know, 40 hours a week, making like 500 bucks a week, you know, back then, um, or not, not 500 bucks a week, uh, uh, like, like 75 or 80 bucks a week. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, long story short, um, he asked me what were some of my bigger goals and dreams, and I didn't have any. So he handed me this document, and on the document, you know, it said the 19, this will date me a little bit, the 1980 goal setting guide. So I was 19, 41 years ago. And he said, listen, I want you to answer some of these questions. Um, and then we could talk after that. So I went and sat in the table next to us. And um, the first question said, at uh, what age do you want to retire? And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm 19. Like, what do you mean retire? I want a job. Um, second question was, how much net worth do you want to have when you retire? And uh, I looked at Mr. Brown and I said, excuse me, sir, uh, what does net worth mean? And he explained to me, I said, okay, um, uh, where do you want to travel? What kind of home do you want? What kind of charitable contributions do you want to make? Uh, what kind of home do you want? What kind of car do you want? What kind of lifestyle do you want? And I just wrote stuff out. And um, I wrote that I want to retire by age 45. I want to have $3 million net worth. I want to have a Mercedes Benz. I want to have a four bedroom house. I want to retire my parents. I want to travel the world. I want to have an Italian wardrobe. And I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And as I handed it to him, I felt selfish, greedy, stupid, uh, but he wanted me to dream. So I dreamt. And he re started reading all this stuff. <clears throat> and he, um, he looks at me, he says, these are some pretty good goals. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and the answer to the question will determine whether you achieve these things or not. And in the back of my mind, I'm sitting there, 19, cocky, arrogant, <laughs> insecure. I'm thinking in the back of my mind, yeah, right. <laughs> One question is going to determine whether I, I achieve all of this stuff that I made up from what I've seen on television. And he looks at me and he says, um, are you interested in achieving these goals and this lifestyle, or are you committed to achieving it? I'm like, what? Am I interested or am I committed? And I was racking my brain for you know, 10, 15 seconds. I just said like, what's the difference, Mr. Brown? He said, well, if you're interested, you'll do what's easy and convenient. He said, if you're interested, you'll allow your stories and reasons and excuses. You'll allow the fact that you failed English and math in grade seven, that you fell two years behind to control your thinking. He says, if you're interested, okay, you'll keep using all of the stories that you're using to justify your results that actually are not great. He said, but if you're committed, you will upgrade your identity to match the new destiny that you wrote down on this piece of paper. He says you will upgrade your knowledge, your skills, your beliefs, your habits, and your behaviors so that they match the achievement of those goals. So are you interested or are you committed? And Robert, I don't know why, <clears throat> but I had words come out of my mouth that said, well, I'm committed. And he reached out his hand and he said, in that case, son, I will be your mentor. I was like, wow, uh, thank you. What's a mentor? <laughs> and Fantastic. I said, this, that's what happened. And um, then he explained to me what a mentor was. I said, that's awesome. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for willing to do this. Uh, he said, great. The first thing I need you to do is move from Montreal to Toronto. I go, what, what do you mean move from Montreal to Toronto? I live in my parents' house. I don't have a car. I've got a job that pays $1.65 an hour. Uh, I don't know, have anywhere to live here. He says, well, you don't need anywhere to live here. You haven't made a decision to move here yet. I said, I know, but I don't have any money. I don't have a job here. I don't know anybody here other than you and my brother. He said, listen, 
Highly successful people make decisions first of what they want, then they figure out how to do it. I said, well, I get that, but I left high school grade 11. I don't have any money. He said, stop. You're already making reasons and stories and excuses, and you haven't decided to move here, and I need you here if you want me to mentor you. This went back and forth for five minutes or so. I said, fine, I'll move here. And my brother then said, well, you can move in with me for a little bit of time. And Mr. Brown says, see, see how easy that is? And he says, the next thing I need you to do is I need you to enroll in real estate school. And there's one starting on May the 5th. I remember these dates like it was yesterday, Robert, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, there's a course starting on May the 5th, 1980. You go to school for five weeks. You graduate on June the 20th. I said, school, <laughs> come on. I'm not going to go back to school. I failed English. But I left high school in grade 11. I am terrible in school and taking tests and, and doing that. So he said, stop. Here you go again. <laughs> Look how quickly you default to your stories and excuses. I go, I understand, Mr. Brown, but it's the truth. It's not a story or excuse. He goes, yes, it is. He says, when you're committed, you do whatever it takes to achieve the result you want. There are no stories or excuses. There's just different strategies. This went on for five or six minutes. I said, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll come to, 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 to do this course. He goes, you need $500 to pay for the club. I have 500 bucks. I got $40 to my name. And this went on three or four times. He said, here you go again. The excuses, the stories. He says, make the decision, figure out how to do it. And I'll make the story shorter now. I'll say, um, two weeks later, I moved from Montreal to Toronto. Uh, about a week and a half after that, I got into the real estate course at Humber College took the course, studied, passed the test. June 20th, I got my real estate license. And I remember these dates because it was the first time in many, many years I actually felt proud of myself and what I did on my own accord and volition. Because up until that time in high school, I cheated to, through as many tests as I could. Because I didn't think I was smart enough, I found another way to get the result that I wanted, which was not the right way, but self-preservation kicked in. And Mr. Brown showed me that with commitment, I could become better. And then he became my mentor, got into real estate, zero salary, commission only sales, which means I got on the phones every day. He taught me a script and over 18 months, I made $180,000 as a 19 year old kid. Amazing. And, and the rest is that history. was the beginning of right. mind blown. Wow. And holy mackerel, we all are so much more capable than mm -hmm. the stories we tell ourselves. Okay, guys, guys, radio. My special guest is John Asaraf. Hey, he's got a book called Inner Size. We're going to get to that shortly. The new science to unlock your brain's hidden power. Mm -hmm. I think John's story was, was all about that. Um, let's, let's get into one of the things I love about your work, John, is you. Um, you uh, play the long game, but you recognize the importance of the, the short game. So it, it seems like what happens with a lot of people, they fall off, they start something, they get into that honeymoon period, they fall off and it's hard, it's hard to keep going. And um, you, you managed to, how did you get over that for yourself in that, in that first year? I mean, you had some of the obstacles that were thrown at you that you mentioned, but how did you, uh, how did you uh, recognize the short-term wins that led to the long-term victory? Mr. Brown set some frameworks for me of expectations first. So whenever I work with any of my clients, whether it's you know, one to many or one-on-one, -on -one, frameworks are really important. So I'll give you an example. Let's say um, I ask everybody that's listening right now, hey, can you run a marathon or jog a marathon right now? Most of us would say, no, I'm in fairly good shape, but I can't jog a marathon right now nonstop for 26.2 miles or 40 kilometers. I can't. I'm not in that good of shape. I said, but what if I shared with you that let's make the decision, a commitment to run a marathon a year from now? And let's say for the first month, all we're going to do is walk and learn what food we should eat, how much rest we should get, and the different types of running that we should be doing. That's the first month. 
And then the next three months, we are going to start slow and we're going to build for maybe 10 minutes a day to 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And the first two or three weeks, you're going to be a little bit sore, but here's what to do when you're sore. And you may notice that you want to eat more and here's what to eat. And you may notice you need to sleep more and here's the sleeping pattern. So what if the first part is my foundation of here is the learning part. Then here is the implementing part. Here is the optimization part. And then here's the acceleration part. What if I broke things up into an expectation frame of here's what you need to do after you make the decision. Here's what the pitfalls are and here's what to do about them. And here's what to expect in the first month, second month, third month, fourth month. So now all of a sudden, when I don't feel like doing it, I've already been trained on what to do when I don't feel like doing it. If I exercise and I'm sore, well, here's what to do as a result of being sore because I've exercised. So what most people have never been given are the right frameworks, not only to set the goal, but how do I achieve the goal in a way that is stress less and effort less, not effortless or stressless, but in a way that I don't have to stress so much because I understand what to expect and I also understand what to do. So when Mr. Brown, you know, had me come into his office the first day, for example, you know, he said, listen, um, since you're new, okay, here's what you're going to do. And he gave me a script that was on a, a like a little um, um, notepad. And he gave me a telephone and a list of numbers to call. And he said, okay, um, you're going to be calling people that you don't know. Some of them will hang up on you. Some of them will scream at you. You know, some of them will be interested to know what you're saying. And none of it has anything to do with you. He said, and here is the script of what you're going to say. Hi, this is John Asraf with Allen Brown Real Estate Company. We have somebody who's looking to make a move into the neighborhood. Have you thought about making a sale? Now, I can recite that today. <laughs> literally 41 years later, because he had me practice it every single day with another person in the office who was just learning it and with other people who mastered it. So I learned some opening lines. I learned that some people would hang up on me. It has nothing to do with me. So I learned how not to take, you know, failure or rejection personally. They were just saying no to what I asked them. And if they were angry that I called them, he said, listen, maybe you caught them in the middle of dinner or sex. They're angry because you interrupted them. So they're going to hang up on you. And they might even call you names, but it's not about you. So I go, oh, okay. And my job, he said, call 100 people a day. And if they say this, then you say that. If they say this, you say that. So he gave me a framework of expectations. He gave me an opportunity to upgrade my skills and my knowledge. And then he had me rehearse and then practice with real people. And I didn't know the scripts, but I practiced the scripts enough that over a month, three months, six months, the scripts and I became one. 41 years later, I can recite every script that I learned under his tutelage. I can recite the answer to every objection that somebody would give me in the scenario that I was playing in. So no differently than you have to learn the rules of a game of any sport. You have to learn the rules of knitting. You have to learn the rules of chess or checkers. There were rules. So I was taught the rules. I was taught the practice. And then I was taught to frame things in a way that empowered me versus disempowered me. That's training. That's skill building. And for everything that we want to achieve in life on this little blue planet, okay, in 2022, the how-to already exists. There's almost nobody who's listening right now that's trying to colonize Mars. So you don't need to be innovative. You need to learn the foundation and the fundamentals first. Then you need to learn the more advanced things afterwards. But most people do not have the foundation of mental mastery, emotional mastery, and habit mastery. 
That's that's a great point. You know, we live in a culture where it's a uh, it's uh, the, the consensus, the collective agreement is you work harder and you, you have to work harder, or I do this and I get that, I do this and I get that, I do this and I get that. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Uh, I like your practicality. Police, officer, police yeah. officers work hard. Right. Teachers work hard. Firefighters work hard. They don't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. People digging ditches work hard. They don't make a lot of money. So the old belief or the old adage, you know, work harder is a myth. It's not true. It's just not true. But if you believe that it's true, then it's true. Um, but people also, you know, at one point in their life believed that Santa Claus was real and it served its purpose until it didn't. Well, let me ask you this, John. How, when did you uh, make the connection between what you're teaching and the, there is a practicality aspect of it that I love? At, just as a human and also somebody who's into sports because everything I run three marathons, everything you said is true. And um, we live in a reactive society. Everybody kind of just does, they go along. It's very automaton and it doesn't have to be that way. When did you make the connection between neuroscience and the work that you were doing and the success that you were achieving? Sure. So let me just um, say something that I don't agree with. Okay. We don't live in a reactive society, okay? okay. Um, however, most people have never learned how to respond okay. instead of react. So most people react because they haven't been trained how to respond, like a Navy SEAL, an astronaut, a firefighter, a police officer that needs to learn how to respond. So part one, but part two, when, when Mr. Brown, you know, helped me set goals and then helped me, he, he also asked me some questions. And he was questions like, question like, okay, in order to achieve this goal, my goal back then was I want to make, initially it was $5,000 a month. And that was like a stretch goal for me back in 1980, right? My father never made more than 25 grand in a year selling or, or, or driving a cab. So I thought 25 grand a year would be amazing, but um, Mr. Brown said that's too low. He said there's plenty of real estate agents making 100,000, 250,000, 500,000 dollars a year. I was like, what? Holy mackerel! He said, you know, let's start you with 5,000 dollars a month. I'm like, 5,000 dollars a month. He says, yeah, let's set a goal that's going to stretch you that you don't know how to achieve. But in order to achieve the goal, you have to also develop the beliefs. Okay, required to achieve the goal. So he asked me a question. What would be the number one thing that you would have to believe in order to achieve that goal? I said, well, I have to believe that I'm smart enough. I never had an issue with being worthy enough. I thought I was worthy, but I didn't think I was smart enough. Uh, I didn't think I had the knowledge or the skills to do it. So I said, well, I'd have to believe that I was smart enough because I suffered with not feeling I was smart enough because of school. And then um, uh, he said, well, what, what would you also have to believe about the possibility of, of that happening? I said, well, I have to believe that it's possible. And from the other agents I've talked to in the office, it's possible because they're doing it. Um, so that belief was already instilled. You know, I'd have to believe that I could learn right, which was back tied to my not being smart, I could learn about real estate law, and real estate financing and, and selling and marketing. And so I'd have to learn that, you know, I could do that. He said, great, well, let's create an affirmation. And the affirmation was really simple. I'm so happy and grateful for the fact that I am more than smart enough to become a real estate agent making at least $5,000 a month. And he had me read it. He had me write a whole bunch more beliefs that weren't true at the time. And I read them every day. I ran my right fingers across them, my left fingers across them. I visualized them. I recorded them. I listened to them every single day on my way to the office, back home, every day, every day, every day, every day. And at the beginning, Robert, when I would listen to it and even read it, there'd be a part of my brain that says, bullshit, that's not true. You're not smart enough. Look at the evidence you have in school. And uh, he taught me to just go next. Just here, I'm not smart, I'd go next. I listen to it again and reinforce it. And he said, even if you listen to a lie long enough, the lie becomes the truth. 
in essence, back then, it was brainwashing. That's what it was called back then. So I literally washed my brain of the limiting beliefs and I rinsed it with the empowering beliefs that I read and listened to and visualized every day. And I remember you know, him telling me that visualization is simulation and whatever you practice becomes permanent. So I practiced language patterns around my self-image, self-worth, self-esteem and beliefs. And then I upgraded my knowledge and skills so that I could learn how to sell better. And then they started to match my beliefs and my knowledge and skills drove my behavior, which means I made more calls. I got better at closing deals because I learned how to sell a skill. I learned how to market better. And at that time, marketing for me was phone calling. Just pick up the call, the phone and call people or go and sit in an open house and talk to people. And as my skill level went up and my beliefs in myself went up, I started to produce more and more results. And I was like, oh, wow, this is working because there's no other reason for it to work. So I got fascinated, you know, uh, and that's probably why I really focused on being a behavioral neuroscience researcher. Um, I got fascinated with what actually happened to me from a mechanical perspective with the human brain. And then when I was building my own real estate company, um, we had a you know, phenomenal first um, you know, five years and we hit a billion two in sales um, in the first five years. And I said, how come we're stuck? Like we're stuck and we were doing great, but we were stuck. I knew there was another like 3 billion to, 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 to generate out there. And, um, and I realized that we weren't doing any of the mental training for our agent. We were doing the skill building of how to sell more, list homes, sell houses, close deals. But when, when you understand behavior, people don't achieve what they're capable of achieving. People achieve what they're conditioned to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And so we have these expectation points in our brain. And so I said, I wonder what would happen if I taught my real estate agents the very same things that I did and taught maybe made it a little bit better. So we did a little test. Um, we got, I think it was 75 agents. It was 75 agents decided they want to be part of this six month coaching on mindset and emotional mastery. And I had them do visualization and meditation and mindfulness and affirmations and declarations and promises and all this stuff every day for six months. And that hundred, I said that 75 agent group increased sales above the year before, same group year before by $100 million. Yikes. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So I knew that it was possible to train other people's brains. And then we started training the rest of the company. And that's how we went to four and a half billion three years later. Wow. One, one of the things that you stress, which I also, uh, I agree with, I think it's so important is writing it down. The importance of um, documentation, chronicalizing your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your commitment. Talk to us a little bit about that, John, the importance of writing things down. Yeah, I mean, if, if you were to look at my, at, my, at my desk, I mean, I write stuff down and I take what, what I write down and I get it onto my computer. And uh, why? Well, um, I, you, everybody else, uh, we have about 6,000 thoughts a day. 6,000 thoughts a day, 43 or 400, you know, I'm sorry, 43,000 thoughts, you know, in a week, right? Uh, 43,000 thoughts in a week, you know, 200 or so thousand thoughts a month, 2.5 million thoughts in a year. Why write it down? Well, if I get the thoughts out of my head and I write it down, and then I take the, you know, the hundred thoughts that are important, I say, which 10 are really important? Like which 10 are really, really important as it relates to my health, wealth, relationship, career, business, finances, spiritual growth, charity, whatever it is. Which 10 really do I want to focus on out of these 2 million thoughts that I have, right? And then if I focused on those things and I learned the skill of paying attention, it's a skill like tennis, like ping pong. If I learned the skill of focusing my energy, okay, you know, general sunlight will give you a nice tan. A magnifying glass will burn a piece of paper if the sunlight goes through the magnifying glass. But 
a laser will cut through steel because it takes the same energy and reduces it to a single photon instead of scattered energy. So why write down my thoughts? Well, if I invest the time on the vision that I have for my life or for a result that I want in health, wealth, race, career, business, and then I set some goals of what do I want to achieve by when, and then I take some time to say, well, how can I achieve those things? What do I need to think? How do I manage my emotions? What do I need to do? And then my time and energy is focused on how can I make those things that I want to trade my life for a reality? That by default then says that I am going to not allow not only my 6,000 thoughts a day to interfere unless it can help me achieve that goal, but I'm also not going to allow you to distract me. I'm not going to allow social media and TV and radio and all this crap that's out there trying to penetrate my consciousness to distract me because I have made a choice of what I want to trade my life for. So I don't have to be smarter than you. I just have to be more aware and focused than you are to win. Okay, let's get into uh, inner size. So my special guest, John Asarap, the name of the show is Guys Guys Radio with Robert Manny. You've got a new book, John, it's called Inner Size, A New Science to Unlock Your Brain's Hidden Power. It'll help you uh, release emotional, mental obstacles, eliminate inner blocks, turn fear into fuel for success, remove self-doubt, add significance and meaning to your life. Uh, why this book? Why now? Um, why this book? Why not? Why now? Well, first and foremost, if you think about everybody knows exercise to strengthen your muscles, right? To strengthen your organs, your lung capacity, your heart, um, your liver, et cetera. Well, what do we know about the human brain? We have a hundred billion dollar brain. Every one of us does. Every brain functionally works the same. And the average person can't tell me very much about their own brain. And so we have a brain where we have thoughts. Um, it produces emotions, feelings, sensations. Um, it produces our entire experience of reality, of what I can or cannot achieve, what scares me, what motivates me, what caused me to sabotage or procrastinate. And yet I have no idea how to use my brain as best as I can. And we can't even recreate it with $100 billion. So I came up with, you know, what is it that I've been doing for 41 years? And the answer is I've been innersizing. What if we said, well, we have bicep muscles and we have tricep muscles and we have ab abdominal muscles and glutes and all this stuff and we can strengthen our muscles. Well, what about strengthening our neuro muscles? What if focus is a muscle you could train in the metaphorical sense? What if awareness is a neuro muscle? What if my habits are a series of neuro muscles? Some are empowering me and some are not. Some are constructive, some are destructive, some are positive, some are negative. Is it possible to rewire my brain so that I am more empowered and I achieve more of my potential versus feeling like I have potential? And the answer is yes. And when we think about are your beliefs a form of a muscle. Well, our beliefs can be strong or weak, right? They could be right or wrong. They could empower us or disempower us. Well, what do we know about the brain? Well, just like I can strengthen my bicep muscle, I can strengthen my neuro muscles, my core ones that allow me to achieve what I want faster and easier than ever before. So I came up with this body of work around inner size to give people much more control of an asset they already own with no mortgage on it, mm -hmm. their brain. So the book's broken into three parts. You've got knowing your brain, uh, mastering your thoughts and emotion, and then mastering your behavior. Uh, is this a step-by-step -step process then, John, for people to follow? Sure, absolutely. A lot of people, you know, number one, they haven't been given the frameworks, right? So I'm giving them frameworks of why aren't you achieving your goals? Well, maybe you're just following the wrong frameworks and process. It's not that you can't achieve your goals. You just haven't been given the right frameworks. And so I created the book in a way that here's, here is the power, 
that you already have your brain. And here's a user's manual to allow you to use it better. So your thoughts, I already mentioned, you know, we have about 6,200 thoughts a day, but thoughts is different than thinking, right? We have emotions and most people are controlled by their emotions. Well, why? Your emotions are nothing more than, uh, than uh, something that is being triggered in your subconscious mind based on what's happened in your memory in the past. Right? Your emotions are nothing more than signals based on a map of reality that may not be the right map. Right? So when we start to understand that, oh, here's why you know, I'm feeling stressed out, here's why I'm anxious, here's why I'm procrastinating, here's why I'm sabotaging my success, here's why I have so many negative thoughts, Oh, wow. oh, and by the way, here's how to let go of what's not serving you. And here's how to be more in control so that you're empowered. I wrote it to give people uh, a way to feel empowered to trade their life for what they love versus being a victim of their past or their present circumstances. And we've learned more about our human brain in the last 15 years than we knew in the last 500 years. Right? So we, you know, unless you want to go see a psychiatrist or psychologist, we have to be our own neuromechanic. And there's not that many people. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. One of the things I like about the book is that you, you, you describe the different areas of the brain that most people do not, are not aware of, which is great. And then you get into practical situations. And it seems like uh, one of them, every time something comes up, you put them into this uh, deep breathing exercise, six breaths yeah. in with positivity, if you will, and then releasing stress outwardly. Tell us a bit, little bit about some of the rituals that are so important for people staying on the path. So when we talk about a, you know, a simple breathing exercise, the, the question is like, why do I, like I breathe, I don't have to think about breathing. Um, and I agree, you know, in order for you just to, uh, you know, inhale the, uh, uh, oxygen and the, um, you know, the um, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, when you breathe in and sulfur and sulfur and phosphorus, uh, your body knows what to do. That's part of your autonomic nervous system. But we also know that when um, we have two parts to our nervous system, right? And so we have uh, our fight and flight part of our nervous system known as the sympathetic nervous system, and that's there to protect us. And whenever um, uh, the demand out there or in here exceeds our current capacity, that stress signal activates. And in a stress signal, the thinking part of the brain, which is I call the Einstein part of the brain, goes offline. And the Frankenstein's monster part of the brain goes online. And the Frankenstein monster is going, what if? Well, what if I fail? What if I'm embarrassed? Um, what if I am rejected, ashamed, ridiculed, or judged? Well, I don't want that. So our brain naturally says, well, move away from the thing that you need to do as a protective mechanism. So when we breathe six slow breaths in through our nose and out through our mouth, it actually resets our nervous system to turn this doubt, fear, anxious, uh, uncertain, weary part of our brain off the Frankenstein's monster and reactivates the Einstein genius part of our brain. And most people don't know how to do that. So breathing six deep breaths into your nose slowly and out through your mouth resets the nervous system. And then if you add, for example, I breathe in calmness or I breathe in certainty or I breathe in courage, I breathe out whatever it is you want to breathe out, you're actually giving your brain an instruction to release the neurochemicals associated with the words you're using. Because most people forget that behind my skin, and you know, if you're looking at me right now, all your, there, there's a brain with a nervous system attached to it. And that nervous system is releasing the neurochemical, the electrical activity, the neurochemicals associated with words, images. So if I'm in a stress situation or a doubtful situation, I am actually releasing the neurochemicals associated with that situation or that thought. So there are neurochemicals like um, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin uh, that are like 
the real good, happy, uh, loving, positive, reward-based uh, neurochemicals. And then there's the um, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are the stress hormones. Now we can use both in the right combination. They're like rocket fuel in the wrong combination. You know, they cause us to sabotage. They cause us to freeze. They cause us not to take action. And so the question then becomes, well, if I have a brain and I could self-regulate better, wouldn't that put me in more control? Of course. So then I don't have to be a victim of these negative or disempowering emotions. No, I don't have to be a victim of negative thoughts. No, you're not your thoughts. You're not your emotions. And you're certainly not your behaviors, but you do have all of those. So if you don't have the training, how are you ever going to get better? Fantastic. Well, a lot of it's about um, rewiring, kind of reframing. It's like software almost. It's almost like you're a software engineer. You're teaching us how to reframe, rewire our subconscious because a lot of people aren't aware that the subconscious takes care of like 95% of our, our lives. And That's if we can get a handle on that and reframe it and rewire it, we can just make quantum leaps forward. Is that true, John? It's 100% true. And, and you think of yourself as you've got to be a better software engineer and realize that when you were born, you were born with some software, but that software was for digestion. That software was to you know, eat food, digest, make poop. That software was to beat your heart. That software was to regulate your blood pressure. That software was to grow hair and nails and, and, and skin and things like that. That software was part of your autonomic, your automatic part of your being that you really don't have much control over. And if you think you do, hold your breath and see if you can stop breathing for good. You can't because there's some biological processes that have been evolving for billions of years for survival. So you can't override those, okay? Uh, unless you obviously take enough drugs um, you know, to kill yourself. But ask yourself this question, were you born with any beliefs? No. Were you born with any fear? No. Were you born with a self image of you're good enough? No, those are all, Patterns that were created because of your parents, teachers, environment, television, what stories you were read to, right? That developed these patterns. The patterns got reinforced. The dominant patterns became your truth and your reality. Now, there are some people who believe that they're not smart enough like I did because I had evidence. So somebody had to help me create more new evidence that overrode the old paradigm. Um, how many people that are listening believed in Santa Claus when they were kids or the tooth fairy? Well, it seems so real. My, my, my parents taught me this. My, my siblings are, are, are playing around with Santa came down the chimney. Let's go to the Christmas tree and see what gifts were put around. Well, we believe that with our whole heart and soul. Well, then we learned something that overrode that, that we overwrote the software, okay. right? So we're getting tight ahead. on time. Just I want to get one last question in, and then I want to sure. give you a little bit of time to talk about your, uh, the work you do and how people get in touch with you and take advantage of some of the programs you have uh, online. So um, what would be your best advice for people who want to get started on kind of uh, the self hypnotic reframing their, uh, reframing their subconscious and getting on the right path? And then what would be your advice as to the first time they run into a couple of roadblocks, how do they stay on that path? Sure, so, so number one, listen, you've been talking about my, my newest book, Inner Size, which is an Amazon number one bestseller. Inside the book, there isn't just what to do, but there's how to do it with instructions, but it also comes with nine free brain training audios of me guiding you through nine of the inner sizes. So the book's like 14 bucks on Amazon. You're gonna get the audio for free worth like 197 bucks, so get the book. Uh, number two, if you wanna dive deeper into, you know, uh, changing your brain, so you, let's say change your income, um, sign up for our Brainathon, uh, which you can sign up at brainathon.com, brainathon.com, part two. Now, part number three, there almost isn't a person alive 
that learned how to ride the bicycle without being shaky at first and fall, right? We, we all did because we got to learn balance the pedal, you know, looking ahead, holding the, 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 the handlebars, moving our feet, learning where the brakes are, uh, right brake, left brake, turn left, turn right, cars, other. So it's confusing at first. And we're all clumsy beginners at first. And the key is practice is what not only teaches us what to do, but there's another part of our brain called the air detection mechanism, okay, EDT, uh, EDM. And so this air detection mechanism actually needs to learn the errors that we make in order to wire the brain. So what if we said, hey, I'm going to get started with this. And I know I'm going to fall. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know I'm going to hit roadblocks, whether it's internally or externally. I'm going to celebrate because I'm going to ask myself, what did I discover and learn? So I'm going to do it in a state of curiosity. In a state of curiosity, we actually activate the neuroplasticity switch of learning. So when we do that, now we say, OK, what did I do? What happened? What did I learn? How do I tweak and adjust? Fantastic. And so what if we just said, it's OK for me to feel uncomfortable at first? And we only are going to be uncomfortable until we're not uncomfortable anymore. It doesn't matter if you want to learn how to you know, be in front of a camera or on your first podcast or you know, showing the world your program product or service or asking for a raise, we get better through practice. And so why not make practice fun? Mm -hmm. Great stuff, John, really. So honored that you're here. I hope all of my listeners yeah. out there learned as much as I did today. And I read the book and I took a lot of notes and I've got a, like 50 more questions to ask, but I got so much out of this today and I'm so glad you graced us on Guys Guys Radio. I hope we can do it again because I got a million more questions and you're fantastic and you're thank an you. inspiration. So thanks for, the great, thanks for the great work you're doing. The name of the book is InnersizeMyNeuroGym.com. John Asaraf one of the stars of the secrets and a true leader in helping people live their best lives. So thank you for being on guys, guys radio, John. Thank you so much, Robert. Appreciate it. If you're enjoying the guests and content we bring you each and every week on guys, guys, radio and TV, please support us by subscribing to our channels. Thank you.